Hi, and welcome to the fifth edition of Distilled Demographics, a series of videos we've been doing here at PRB to, to boil down some of the important demographic measures and numbers, the ones you really need, uh, and to make it fun, too, at the same time, at least as much as you can. Uh, in the past uh, few videos, we talked about births and deaths and the way they affect a population, one increasing it and uh, one decreasing it. That was pretty easy, though, because a birth and a death is pretty easily defined. Uh, now, they are not always counted uh, completely. In fact, in many developed countries, they aren't. But at least a birth and death is something we, we know what it is. Immigration is a whole different thing. Immigration statistics are a, kind of a minefield uh, in, in the world of demography, and pretty soon we'll see why. But first, let's see how the whole thing works together, births, deaths, and migration. We'll use the example of Sweden, a country with very good statistics. According to Statistics Sweden, at the end of 2008, the population was 9,256,347. At the end of 2009, it was 9,340,682. So, Sweden grew, simple math, 84,335 in 2009. Now, there are two other things we know. Uh, births and deaths are completely registered in Sweden, at least we're pretty sure they are. And the number of births in 2009 was 111,801. Additionally, 90,080 people died in 2009 in Sweden. So the difference there is what we call natural increase, births minus deaths. 21,721 is the number by which births exceeded deaths. And we call that natural increase. If it were the other way around, and it is in some, some countries of the world, where more people die every year that are born, we call it natural decrease. Uh, you were probably ahead of me on that one. Okay, so let's look at uh, the rest of growth. We said Sweden grew by about 84,000 and 21-some thousand was due to natural increase. So there's a third culprit in there somewhere, and of course, that's migration. Uh, during 2009, there were 102,280 immigrants who came to Sweden to live. 39,240 people left to go live someplace else. So that gives us a net migration of 63,040. So, Sweden grew by 84,000 some, natural increase was 21, 721, and a net migration was 63,040. Now, for those of you who've been lightning fast with your calculators and out ahead of us, you might notice that those things don't quite add up. They miss by about 426, which is actually pretty good going. And, uh, but it does serve to illustrate that even a country with really good statistics, things might not quite add. So now we've seen how population grows in, in Sweden. Uh, another way to measure the effect of migration on a country is the net immigration per 1,000. By the way, I was, had drilled into me in graduate school, there's no such thing as a net migrant. We only say net migration. A bit of jargon for you there. So let's see how it, but let's see how it affected Sweden. Um, Sweden had seven net immigration, seven persons in net immigration per thousand population in 2009. So that's the effect that it had. Uh, the United States has the largest uh, number of migrants coming to any country in a particular year. It's been averaging about a million, although it's probably down a bit due to the recession. But the U.S.'s rate is, is actually fairly low compared to some other developed countries, uh, at about three per thousand. Uh, the other, uh, I guess we could call them New World countries, who grew just like the U.S. did, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, they have actually much higher rates of immigration, which is sometimes kind of surprising. Uh, we can also look at the other side of the coin, countries that have uh, 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 negative uh, net immigration, or more people leaving than, than coming in. Uh, Mexico, uh, it's about minus five per thousand. And some of the Baltic states, like Lithuania, um, has about the same, about minus five. Uh, and often migration can have a very, very 
big impact on island nations. So look, for example, at Micronesia, Federated States of Micronesia, minus 15 per thousand. So now let's go on. We'll enter the minefield and talk about what exactly is an immigrant. Okay, so into the minefield of definitions. What's an immigrant? Well, you know, we all think we know what an immigrant is. Isn't that obvious? It's someone who moves here to into your country, your mind, to, to take up residence, to live there, to take up a usual residence. Uh, but it's not quite so simple, especially when we try to look these things up in statistics. Uh, for example, uh, in the U.S., our yearbook of immigration statistics says that there were 1.1 million uh, immigrants who came to the U.S. during fiscal year 2009. But there's a fly in the ointment, a pretty big one. Two-thirds of those people had actually been living in the U.S. for a number of years, some many, many years. It's just that's the year in which they were granted permanent residence. Uh, and that's actually not an unusual definition. For example, in Spain, uh, an immigrant who's someone who signs up on the population register. Uh, we don't have that in the U.S., but a population register uh, keeps track of your whereabouts, where you live, you know, kind of like a national ID system. So you could have been living in the country, but until you either get a green card in the U.S. or you sign up on the register in Spain, and there's many other examples, you're not you're not really an immigrant. And certainly one of the one of the rather interesting aspects of demography is studying the effect of immigration on any population. Uh, one of the ways it can be done uh, is many countries have a question on censuses or surveys on place of birth. So we can study uh, the number of foreign-born people uh, in a uh, country at any time. Uh, an advantage to foreign-born is it's an unchanging characteristic. You know, once you were born in France, you're always born in France. Uh, sometimes the uh, other definitions, such as oh, population of foreign stock or foreigners, can change. Uh, if you gain citizenship, if you marry a native, you may no longer be counted in statistics. Uh, as a foreigner, but foreign-born doesn't change. So here we'll just look at three countries, two in Europe and the U.S., and we see that in Ireland that the percent foreign-born from the early 90s jumped from 6 to 17 percent. Quite a difference. Uh, in Spain, from 2 to 14. Uh, in the U.S., which is, after all, the U.S. is the world's first melting pot, that uh, it jumped, however, from uh, 8 to 13 percent. So there's been a real increase in that. Uh, a lot of the media, however, the attention seems to be oftentimes on, you know, the changes in, tremendous change in society due to immigration. But much of this immigration to countries of Europe may simply be from other countries of Europe. So we can look at, a little more closely now, the foreign-born population in Spain. Uh, in the early 90s, notice that the European-born population and the non-European-born were about equal. Uh, by 2009, both of those had risen, and there was a much larger percentage uh, of people living in Spain who were not born in Europe, uh, as there were, say, some 20 years earlier. So the composition of the foreign-born or immigrant population uh, can certainly change. Why do people migrate? Um, in demography, there's this, this kind of overall theory, I guess you could call it a push-pull, that certain people are like pushed out of the country in which they live and attracted or pulled to another. Uh, probably one of the most common examples of push would be some type of political persecution. Uh, refugees uh, certainly have left the countries in which they're being persecuted and have been put up uh, many times in other countries, especially in developed countries. A pull factor? pull factor is quite simply, higher income. And also the ability then to send money back home, as remittances back home are very important for many developing countries. Uh, if a man from, woman from India goes to work in the Gulf, the Gulf states, in the oil fields or in some other service, and they can send, say, $1,000 a month home, if they can send that much, that's huge for a family uh, receiving it you know, back in the, uh, in the home country. So there's a push, push you out, and a pull to attract you. 
You know, the U.S. has long been called, uh, you know, for many, many uh, centuries, a global melting pot, that everyone came to the U.S., and all the different nationalities somehow formed a single culture. You know, and I think we see a little bit of that happening again uh, on, the, on the world, on, you know, a more worldwide scale. Uh, the United Nations does estimate that 3% of world population is living in a country in which it was not born. Uh, it doesn't sound like a high figure, but when you stop and think about it, it is a pretty large number. Uh, they also estimate that there's about 2.7 million people on a net basis migrate from developing countries to developed. Uh, so we're beginning to have much more of a mix of cultures uh, than I think than, you know, than we once used to. And it works pretty well. Assimil assimilization often is, is easy, but sometimes assimilation is not that easy. Uh, certainly a, an immigrant from Latin America to Spain, uh, you know, has, you know, has kind of an advantage, I mean, because they can speak the language, you know, they can speak Spanish. Uh, but if badly needed nurses going from, say, Vietnam to the Philippines to Japan, where, where the nurses are needed, have difficulty learning Japanese, and I'm sure some of them do, then that's not quite a simple thing. Uh, plus, there's a little bit of a shock sometimes of a different culture moving in when you're not used to that. Uh, but still, you know, just as in the U.S., I think our national dish is pizza, that it's, it's hard not to notice when you go around Germany that everywhere you look there seems to be a donor kebab stand. So perhaps we are all going to mix together in the future more than some people think we do.